Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I will start talking so that by the time I finish, the other people who are trying to uh, dial in will be online as well. It's very good to see so many again. This is our um, third talk in the Hillary Term Fellowship Lunchtime Seminar Series. And as you hopefully now know, they're held on weeks two, four, six, eight on each term. And the whole point of these seminars is, is to enable members of the uh, college community to get a, an insight into some of the fascinating research that's being carried out by people on the fellowship. We often don't have time to do this, and I think this is possibly one area where Zoom has really started to lend itself to enable us to actually exchange ideas and hear what's going on. So our speaker today, I hope doesn't, I hope doesn't need too much introduction. Uh, uh, this is Nick Davison, Professor Nick Davison. Nick's Professor um, of Modern History in the Faculty of History, and also a tutorial fellow in Modern History in the Hall. Nick has been in the hall for almost 23 years, I think, Nick. That's <laughs> quite a long time. Uh, extraordinary. Um, and his main research interests are in the history of Italy in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I have to say, Nick was one of the first people that I started to understand the breadth and uh, depth of the research he did. But he gave the most fantastic talk at the Access Hall Areas event um, when I first arrived in, in May, well, I can't remember what it was, 18, 19. Um, and do take some time, if you have a moment, to look at Nick's uh, publication list. There's some real gems in there to just dip into and to find out what's going on. Um, so Nick's research is shaped by questions around coercion and coexistence and human rights and international law, but in the 16th, 17th centuries, but highly topical today. And I think this very much leads on to the title of Nick's talk, which is again, another very, very provocative and fascinating title, uh, which is Living with Inquisition. So Nick, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction, over generous introduction. Thank you too for, to Andrew for arranging the talks this term. As Cathy said, I think it's a really good way for us uh, to find out more about what we're all doing in the college at a time when otherwise it's so difficult to meet in person. As Cathy said, I work mainly on Italian history in what we call as historians the early modern period, mainly in my case the 16th and 17th century. And one of the advantages, I suppose, of uh, working on Italian history is that necessarily most years I have to spend some time in Italy. Uh, and I confess that that is uh, always a very pleasurable experience. But I didn't start my career as a historian with either the intention or the expectation that I would focus on Italy. I started rather with the intention of exploring what seemed to me at least a particular historical problem. At school I had studied, as many British students are forced to do, I had studied mainly modern history from 1800 to the present. So when I got to university I took the advantage to go back in time and I took papers in ancient history, medieval history and early modern history. And those divisions of the historical past uh, ancient, medieval, early modern, modern, are common in British universities and they reflect a broad consensus among historians of Western Europe, at least, it doesn't work in other parts of the world, but ref a consensus among historians of Western Europe that we can actually distinguish those four broad periods. And what had interested me most as an undergraduate ranging across the periods was that transition from medieval to early modern which is marked conventionally by a whole series of developments, at least in Western Europe. Uh, for example, the development of movable print leading to the press, of a kind we understand, the adoption of gunpowder weapons, which transformed warfare, uh, the first successful escape of Western Europeans from their geographical and cultural isolation at the Western end of the Eurasian landmass. My attention, however, was drawn especially by another conventional marker of that transition from medieval to early modern, the Reformation. Uh, the successful uh, challenge in some parts of Western Europe by Lutherans, Calvinists, Anglicans, to the long established religious, intellectual, cultural, social, political dominance in Western Europe of the Roman Catholic Church. And what interested me most as an undergraduate about that transition was the fact that it was successful only in certain parts of Western Europe. It was successful, for example, in some parts of Germany, 
uh, Switzerland, some parts of Switzerland, the Low Countries, some parts of the Low Countries, all of Scandinavia, bits of the British Isles. But it failed in other parts of Europe. It failed in Ireland, for example, where the consequences of the religious wars of the 16th century have survived into our own lifetime, alas. In France, it prompted uh, several decades of vicious, bloodthirsty civil war massacres from the 1560s to the 1590s, before the battle was really determined in Catholicism's favour. Nobody in any case paid much attention to Protestantism in, say, Spain or Portugal. So in many ways, it was the failure of the Reformation to succeed across Europe that I wanted to explore when I started as a graduate student. But to turn that general interest into a, move, a manageable project, I needed to do two things. First, to narrow it down geographically, it's best to study a particular area. And secondly, associated, to identify a relevant and accessible body of evidence you can use. In other words, an archive of contemporary records from the period. And that was when my attention was first drawn to Italy. I started off thinking I could do French history or Spanish history or something like that. I moved around a bit and then I found myself knocking on the door of an Italian historian. Now that's an odd place perhaps to start. We might think of Italy now as a predominantly Catholic country, at least until the 20th century perhaps. But in the 16th century, the religious authorities in Rome, the papal authorities were genuinely fearful that one or more Italian states would in fact defect to Protestantism. Seems unlikely now, but that was a genuine fear at the time. And at this point, if I can make the technology work, I'm going to try to share my screen. Claire and I were practicing this a little bit before, so I hope I can do it properly. Um, ah, now I hope that is going to show. Can you shout if you're not now seeing a map of Italy? No, we can see it. Oh, you can, that's yeah. great. Good. I need to explain here that Italy in the 16th century was ruled by a large number of separate states. And this is a good old, uh, very ancient schoolboy map of Italy at the end of the 16th century and 1600. And to draw your attention uh, to a number of these larger states, Venice here in the northeast, sort of murky grey colour, uh, Duchy of Milan uh, in the centre of North Italy coming south, Tuscany, Grand Duchy of Tuscany, and then this again sort of purpley part here in the middle uh, is the Papal States uh, run by the Pope as secular ruler, the Pope was secular ruler here as well as head of the church, and then further south the kingdoms of uh, Sicily and Naples uh, which also controls Sardinia. Now of these states Milan and the kingdoms of uh, Naples, Sicily, Sardinia uh, were ruled directly from Spain. In fact, Tuscany was more or less dominated by Spain. Venice remained one of the very few independent states uh, in Italy at this period. And Venice was one of the places, in fact, the place where the papacy most feared that the community, the population, uh, the state itself would turn against Catholicism. And one could argue that there was some good reason for this. Here is a lovely uh, painted image, um, aerial view of Venice uh, from the 1580s in the Vatican Palace. Uh, in uh, Some of you may well have seen this lovely image of Venice from above. Venice was one of the largest cities, perhaps the third largest city in Europe at this stage, around about 200,000 people, roughly the same, maybe a bit bigger than London. It was not only one of the largest, it was also one of the richest cities in Europe. Uh, Northeastern Italy, uh, of course, is still now hugely rich agricultural territory. And the city of Venice was one of Europe's major manufacturing, trading and financial centres in this period. It was also the centre of a, an extensive maritime empire. They called it the Stato de Mar. They didn't like the word empire, uh, but this is a very schematic map of Venetian territories ruled directly from Venice, Venice up in the northeast of Italy, but then down the Adriatic coast into the Balkans, much of Greece, uh, and then into the East Mediterranean, particularly the islands of Crete and Cyprus. That was all ruled directly from Venice. And what is perhaps most significant about Venice in terms of our discussion today is it was certainly the most diverse and the most multicultural city in the whole of Europe. The French ambassador, 
Philippe de Comines, who was living in the city, I think, for eight months in 1494, 1495, in his memoirs, he reports that, and I'm quoting here, most of the people here in Venice are foreigners. That's a bit of an exaggeration, uh, but I think it's one that reflected his daily experience of walking the city's streets, thronged as they were, uh, not just by Italians and Italians from all over the peninsula of Italy with their very varied and incomprehensible different dialects, but also with residents from many other parts of Europe, uh, Germans in particular, Slavs too, large community of Slavs, uh, people from the Balkans, people from Greece, Jews from all over Europe who'd uh, come to Venice for refuge, uh, people from the Ottoman Empire in Turkey and Northern Africa who were Muslims and Jews and many other religions as well, many Eastern Christians, Armenians, Persians as well from beyond the Ottoman Empire, many occupants, many residents in Venice from North Africa. And just as a quick visual depiction of this, I'm showing you here uh, Vettor Carpaccio's Miracle of the Cross, um, beautiful picture uh, from 1494, the very year that Comin arrived in Venice. And it's a picture uh, a bit hard to read in itself. It's a nice, gives you a nice image of what Venice must have looked like around 1500. Um, the bridge you see on the image there is what where is now the Rialto Bridge. This wooden bridge was replaced in the 16th century by the Rialto Bridge. You can actually see a religious procession going across uh, the bridge there in the middle. In fact, that's where the miracle is taking place. Most of the picture is about other things completely. Um, and I want to show you uh, two details from this picture. Uh, this is from the bottom left-hand corner. It shows the Rialto market, uh, various people here in, in European clothes. But if you look up towards the back, you can see clearly some people from I don't know, the Middle East, Turks, Arabs perhaps, and behind them these guys with tall hats, art historians tell me they're from Armenia. And if we go down to another detail, here you have a black gondolier uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. We know there are a very large number of Sub-Saharan Africans in Venice. So it was a remarkably varied, diverse, multicultural city. And what is particularly noteworthy from our con in our context today is that this teeming city uh, with all its different cultures and religion was one of the most tolerant places in the whole of medieval and early modern Europe. The Venetian government not only tolerated this astonishing cultural and religious diversity, they built it into the structure of the local administration. Each community uh, whether it was an Italian community or a non-Italian community, was expected to look after itself, to manage its own affairs, to run its own schools, to set up and run its own healthcare and hospitals, to manage its own charities, even to collect its own taxes for delivery over to the central government. And there was no pressure at any time on any non-Catholic group, Protestants, other Christians, Jews, Turks, whatever, not to believe and practice their own religion, uh, no pressure on them to convert to Catholicism. And the government generally adopted a similar neutrality in the religious wars of the period, the religious wars I've mentioned already in France, uh, in Germany, other places, of course the British Isles at various times. They really didn't want to pick sides in any of those religious wars, nor did they want to antagonize anyone in the regular wars between Catholics and the Muslims in the Turkish Empire. Wherever they could, they stayed away from that sort of, um, that sort of uh, engagement. So it seemed I'd found an interesting place to study. Uh, and the great thing about Venice was that uh, it has a, an amazing collection of archives. Uh, what you see now on the screen is the, is the state archive, the Archivi di Stato in Venice. Uh, on the left, you can see one of the biggest churches in Venice, the Church of the Frari, a Franciscan uh, church originally. Most of the buildings you see in this image were the old Franciscan monastery, so it's a huge complex. They are now the home of the Venetian state archives. Uh, this holds just, it's just one of the archives in Venice. Uh, it holds the official records of the Venetian government up to about 1800. Uh, I'm told by my archivist friends that the archives there are stored on rather more than 70 kilometers worth of shelving. Uh, so it's a huge archive and this is just one. I've worked in many other archives as well. So there's plenty of records there to use. And the starting point for any 
study, I think, of Catholic Protestant relations in the city has to be the records of the local Inquisition tribunal. Now, in some ways, of course, even to mention the Inquisition uh, in the context of Venice sounds a bit odd. After all, I've just been explaining how tolerant Venice was. Yet the Inquisition was founded in the Middle Ages by the Catholic Church precisely to sniff out, hunt down and destroy anyone who believed anything other than the official beliefs uh, explained and taught by the Catholic Church. So what is an Inquisition even doing in a place like Venice in the 16th century? The Inquisition had actually been in Venice since 1289. Uh, when the first inquisitor there was appointed. The ethos, of course, in the 13th century was very different. There were very few non-Catholics in Venice in the 13th century. And it should be stressed, I think, that even in the 16th century, the Inquisition tribunals in the Catholic world were authorised to investigate the beliefs and behaviour only of baptised Catholics. Uh, the Inquisition tribunals had no direct jurisdiction over non-Catholics of any kind, whether they were Protestant or whether they were non-Christian. Uh, so in effect, the vast number of minority people in Venice were completely exempt from the jurisdiction of the Inquisition, for the most part. By the end of the 14th century, the Inquisition tribunals uh, had been established in most parts of Western Europe, except the British Isles, somehow the Brits managed to avoid them, Scandinavia and oddly Castile. And in the 15th century, most of them became pretty well non-active. By the late 15th century, few of these Inquisition tribunals are very active at all. And the papacy makes three successful attempts in the late 15th and early 16th century to revive the Inquisition as an institution in three areas of southern Europe. In Castile, in Spain, 1478, in Portugal, uh, uh, in Iberia from 1536, and in Italy uh, in 1542. What they try to do in Italy is establish a new overseeing body uh, called the Congregation of the Holy Office, um, which is going to oversee uh, and revive the Inquisition tribunals in Italy. Um, and the papacy created this very nice palace for the Congregation of the Holy Office in Rome. The palace actually goes back to the 1510s, but it was refurbished, rebuilt, reconstructed by the papacy in 1566 as the palace of the Sant'Ufizio, the Holy Office. And if we take the next slide, um, this is a rather nice image as if taken from the top of the dome of St. Peter's in Rome, looking across St. Peter's, the colonnade here, the square, uh, across the Tiber into the medieval city of Rome. And the Inquisition Palace is there lurking like some lapdog uh, at the bottom right hand corner. You see quite a large uh, palace from this angle. By 1700, the Congregation of the Holy Office in Rome supervised the work of 46 tribunals in Italy, uh, including the one in Venice, plus a few more uh, strays in Croatia, France, Germany and Malta. By the end of the 18th century, the Venetian tribunal's archive in Venice amounted to some 50,000 pages, invaluable evidence for my interest in the contest between Catholicism and Protestantism. And what do these records consist of? They consist of transcripts of judicial proceedings from denunciations where someone says this person believes the wrong thing, through the questioning of witnesses, the interrogation of suspects, some interrogations of course under torture, to the formal sentences which might be a sentence to some sort of punishment or an absolution. But it's not just those judicial records in the archives. There are all the documents that were found in suspects' houses when those houses were raided and searched. Uh, letters, books, all sorts of other things. Uh, the archives contain formal advice from the tribunal's several legal and theological advisors about how they can proceed. It records reports of extrajudicial conversations uh, with suspects and others by members of the tribunal, including the inquisitor himself. It contains reports of discussions between tribunal members about what they're going to do in individual cases, what their tactics should be, what decisions they might come to. It records, too, discussions and correspondence with 
other inquisition tribunals in Italy and with the Holy Office in Rome, a large amount of correspondence with Rome, but also correspondence and discussions more widely with other bodies, government officials, other magistracies, other clerics, bishops, and so on. You recall it re includes records of the tribunal's other work as well, uh, the censorship of books, for example, the improvement of certain appointments that had to be agreed by the inquisitors, uh, many other formal announcements and rulings they made. So it's a vast, rich archive. And so I found myself in my second term as a graduate student banging on the door of the Venetian State Archive asking to go in, not really knowing what at all I was going to find when I got there. And when I got there and started to read the first trials, I found my interest was led very quickly to a number of other areas of research that I had never anticipated. And I want to say a little bit more in the final 15-20 uh, minutes or so about what those particular areas are that have occupied me. Uh, for a large time now of my career. First, and perhaps a little creepily, uh, I found myself increasingly intrigued by the institution whose records I was spending so much of my life reading. The tribunal in Venice formed part of a large and hierarchic network of similar bodies as we've seen throughout Italy. Within the Venetian state, however, there are a series of subordinate bodies. Uh, in addition to the tribunal in Venice itself, within the Venetian Republic, uh, there are a number of local inquisition representatives in the smaller towns and the rural areas, uh, sort of deputies who just kept an eye on what was going on, and regularly wrote up to the Venetian tribunal. Uh, there were full tribunals in Venice's many subject cities, Padua, Verona, Vicenza, uh, Bassano, Brescia, Bergamo and so on. Uh, cases could be passed up this system from the bottom to uh, the top to the Venetian Inquisition. The Inquisition Tribunal itself could summon cases from those lower tribunals and investigatory bodies uh, to itself. In most of these urban inquisitions uh, in the Venetian state, decisions were made by two officials, uh, the Inquisitor himself and the local bishop. They were supposed to meet jointly and agree decisions themselves. Uh, and the bishop in Venice was actually the archbishop, now the patriarch of Venice, um, who was usually a patri uh, patrician, a member of the ruling class in Venice. Uh, and the inquisitor and the archbishop of Venice, the patriarch, uh, presided over the tribunal, of Venice, uh, tribunal in Venice, but they had with them as a third judge, the papal ambassador. In other words, a diplomat representing the Pope uh, who sat as the third judge. This is, I think, pretty well unique in Inquisition history. So the three judges, the Inquisitor, the Bishop, the Archbishop, and the Papal Ambassador, bizarrely. These three judges were assisted by a host of legal and theological uh, advisors, uh, professional prosecutors, uh, notaries, of course, who kept the records and uh, created the archive, various what the Italians call funti, the best way of translating that is to call them thugs, who were supplied by the state to carry out the forcible work of the Inquisition, uh, including breaking into people's houses, arresting them, searching them, and so on. Um, again, almost uniquely though, uh, the tribunal was assisted by three further senior patricians, members of the government. Um, they were called Savi, wise men, uh, Savi Alarizia, wise men about heresy, but they were all lay people, they were all uh, patricians, members, senior members of the government. Uh, and they intervened actively, we can tell, in the investigations, in the discussions, uh, and although they were not in the end officially supposed to be responsible for any of the decisions, it's clear they often influenced the way the judges did decide. And above the Venetian Inquisition, of course, was the Congregation of Rome. And similarly, the Congregation in Rome could call cases to itself, appeals against the decisions of the Venetian and other Inquisitions could be passed up to uh, the Roman Inquisition. And the Roman Inquisition itself, the Congregation in Rome, was involved in a huge amount of correspondence, answering queries, sending instructions, uh, debating what to do. And so these records in Venice, the other Italian cities I've looked at, uh, in Rome as well, uh, provide abundant information 
about how these various officials on these tribunals work together. Uh, they provide enormous information about the legal framework within which these guys worked, uh, which structured their work and controlled and contained what they did. It contains a lot of information as well about their career patterns. I became very interested at one point about how you made a career in the Inquisition. If a little boy said what he was asked, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to become an inquisitor. What exactly would he do uh, to make his career in the inquisitorial system? There are various paths you can follow and I could tell him what to do. Many inquisitors ended up uh, moving from one inquisition to another. Many of them moved from a local inquisition up to Rome, of course. Many of them became bishops. Many of them became cardinals. Four of the 16th century inquisitors, uh, it, four 16th century inquisitors in Italy became popes. Three of those four had worked in Venice. So it's a very interesting career pattern. And another thing that I became interested in uh, more and more as I studied in the Inquisition records was the range of offences uh, that people uh, were said to have committed and which were investigated by the tribunals. I sort of assumed it would all be about matters of belief. I was expecting to find trials of people who for example, denied the existence of God or said that Christ was not really present in the host at mass. Uh, I expected to find people who believed in magic, in witchcraft, in necromancy, in demon worship and things like that. But the tribunals also dealt with matters of practice, not fasting on Fridays or in Lent, having meat on Fridays or in Lent, for example. They tried cases of blasphemy, very common in Venice. Uh, they tried cases of people accused of destroying damaging religious images. Uh, they tried a vast number of sexual offences as well. Concubinage, adultery, bigamy, polygamy, sodomy, sex with nuns, friars or, or monks, sex with children became an interest of mine at one stage looking at child abuse in Venice because of these trials. It dealt both with clerical indiscipline uh, priests, for example, who had misbehaved in the confessional, but also with lay indiscipline, uh, with lay people who impersonated priests, uh, who celebrated mass or confession or exorcism or marriage without actually being ordained to do so. Uh, they investigated surprisingly common claims of individuals to be saints or miracle workers. The tribunal was also responsible for the censorship of books, the prosecution of those who read or owned, who bought or sold, who printed prohibited books. It even investigated artists uh, who painted what were thought to be suspect, unorthodox or heretical images. The most famous case in Venice is probably Paolo Veronese uh, for this fabulous painting, Christ in the House of Levi, uh, 1573. He was actually commissioned to paint uh, an image of the Last Supper, and this is what he produced. Uh, and he was denounced for this on the grounds that this was not an accurate representation of what scripture said happened at the Last Supper. Uh, he had, of course, been asked to paint this vast painting. It's one of the biggest 16th century paintings that survived. Uh, and he had to fit it with something. And he said, well, I had to make a lot of, I had to put lots of people in because it's a lot of space. And they said, but who are all these people? Um, who's this guy? No, he's just someone who's wandered in from uh, the street, says Veronese. Who, what, what's this dog doing? Oh, that's the uh, owner of the house's dog. And they say, but none of this is in the Bible. And they say, well, yeah, but you've got to fill the space. And they came to a rather a neat solution. Instead of uh, telling him to destroy it because it was heretical and unscriptural, they said, why don't you just change the title? So it became Feast in the House of Levi, uh, a rather obscure event recorded in the New Testament. And so it survived and it's now in the uh, gallery, the Academia in Venice. So I got interested in the institution, I got interested in all the offences, uh, the trials, the things they were looking at. But what exactly was the purpose of all this activity? Now what I'm going to say next might seem a little unusual or unlikely even, but essentially the purpose of the Inquisition, the work of the Inquisition, was seen at the time as part of the church's pastoral role. The Inquisitor's intention in theory was to convert those who had strayed from the path of truth and righteousness and to save them therefore from the pains of everlasting punishment in hell after death. Suspects who were found guilty and who repented 
and who accepted church teaching, they said, I accept church teaching, were usually given very light penalties. Um, they were usually asked to perform some regular liturgical commitments, for example, three Hail Marys every Friday for a year, something like that. Some of them were sentenced to educational commitments, regular tutorials with the Inquisitor or with some other uh, senior priest. That must have been a bit grim. More severe penalties could also be handed down for those who were unrepentant, uh, fines, imprisonment, even execution. Um, repeat offenders were also supposed always to be executed, though in fact in Venice uh, they were normally um, spared execution, um, assuming they said once again that they were sorry. And mentioning execution is an important matter. Uh, by 16th century standards, rates of inquisition, uh, execution and inquisition were relatively low. The Italian tribunals generally rarely executed more than about 2% of those they investigated. That compares to the inquisition in Portugal, for example, which executed about 6%, and those were low figures compared to the execution rates of secular tribunals at the time. State magistrates were very keen on execution. So that was one area I was interested in uh, increasingly about the Inquisition as an institution and its practices. But as you might have gathered already from what I said about the offences, uh, I also became increasingly drawn into the lives of the men, the women and the children, many thousands of them, who were questioned and investigated by the tribunal, particularly in Venice. For the Inquisition records are an historical sociologist's dream, to be honest. Every interrogation, most questioning of witnesses, start with a set of questions. Uh, of course, you're asked your name, you're asked your place of birth, where you were educated, uh, where you live, what your family, who you have as your family, are you married, do you have children, do you live alone, who your friends are, what is your employment history, where have you been traveling, and so on and so forth. These are standard questions which the tribunal just needs to get hold of, and it's recorded. Uh, they also, of course, ask more detailed questions about the recent events, conversations, relationships, allegations, which have prompted the investigation. Um, and, of course, they also ask suspects and witnesses about their own beliefs, their practices, their behaviour, their relationships. And some people who are questioned, interrogated, are required to repeat their whole life story. And I just give you one example so you can see see the sort of case I'm talking about. And this one I choose because it has some rather distant relationship to Oxford. Uh, a young lad of 17 uh, appeared before the Venetian tribunal in August 1577. Uh, he was called Orazio Cocco, 17 year old. Uh, this is 1577. His parents had both died during the devastating plague uh, in the previous two years when around a third of the city's population had perished. He had survived the plague because he'd moved out of Venice in 1575. And he moved out of Venice because in 1575, he'd been a choir boy at the church of Santa Maria Formosa, uh, not far in fact from the Rialto. Uh, and when he'd been singing one day in that church, he'd been noticed by no lesser figure than Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, who was for really rather odd reasons in Venice at the time. And after hearing Orazio's singing voice, the Earl had invited young Orazio, 15 at the time, to join his household then in Venice and then to return to England with him. And Orazio actually left the city, therefore, a little time later, getting away from the plague, of course. And he and, Ox he and the Earl of Oxford and Oxford's household landed at Dover on the 20th of April, 1576. Orazio thereafter lived in Oxford's house in London for 11 months, during which time he said he'd been allowed to live as a Catholic without any problem. He'd met a number of other Italians, he told the Inquisitor, in London, including five other Venetians who were employed at the royal court. He most certainly means the Bassano brothers, whose concert of recorders continue to perform in London uh, for several decades after Orazio was there. Orazio had also sung in person in front of Queen Elizabeth I, who did actually try to convert him to Anglicanism. Uh, but in March 1577, 1577, for reasons he never quite explains, he decided he wanted to leave uh, London and leave the Earl's household. So he got in touch with a number of Italian merchants in London um, who took him to the Low Countries, where he fell in with some rather vicious Italian soldiers, mercenaries, presumably, uh, fighting in the uh, Netherlands wars at the time. 
Uh, and then he moved with them through Burgundy, through Lorraine, into Savoy and so back to Italy and Venice. So you get this whole life story of this 17 year old, for goodness sake, uh, given voluntarily to the Inquisition uh, and their surviving for our uh, delight in the Inquisition archive. And this brings me, I think, to the third additional focus that I uh, discovered when I started working in these archives, not just the institution itself, not just um, the lives of the men, women and children who are involved in it, but the psychodrama of the trials themselves. The trial transcripts record the encounters in the tribunal between the Inquisition and uh, suspects, witnesses and so on, word for word. And interestingly, the notaries who make these records will often add comments about the suspects and witnesses' physical performance, so physical behaviour. Uh, you get these little notes in a record saying, at this point, the witness seemed a little nervous. Uh, at this point, he stammered and couldn't get his words out. He seemed very hesitant. He blushed and so on. None of this, of course, is surprising. The Venetian Tribunal was, as we've seen, an alarmingly authoritative institution. It had the power of life and death in this life. It also had the power over, if you're a believer, your fate in eternity. This is a pretty scary institution. Its tribunals were staffed by seriously dominant individuals, by the local archbishop, almost always a wealthy patrician, by the papal ambassador, a senior um, uh, diplomat from another state, but up to three additional patricians, senior government members responsible for, for facilitating and implementing uh, the tribunal's decisions. Well, that's Sir Cocco's testimony in 1577 was witnessed, for example, by Pasquale Ciccogna, who just a few years later was elected Doge, head of state. This is a very, very senior man. For any suspect, therefore, and for most witnesses, a meeting of the tribunal was at least a threatening context in which you're being asked questions. It was, however, as I discovered, uh, a context in which both sides uh, in the dialogue are engaged in a slightly risky game. Witnesses and suspects had to decide, usually without any warning, of course, what they thought the tribunal wanted or expected them to say, and the information, therefore, that they should or should not reveal to the tribunal. But the tribunal members as well had to manipulate the encounters in ways that would, by contrast, reveal precisely the information they wanted and not the information they didn't want. So both sides are really playing a sort of game here. Uh, and we sometimes find, in fact, surviving in the archive records, little notes that the tribunal officials had made for themselves about how they're going to run the particular interrogation. I'll give you just one example, the trial records of Lucia Schiavona, uh, who was investigated in the summer of 1578, a year or so after Horatio Cocco, she was investigated for using magic against her lover. He alleged that she had paralyzed him. Uh, by using her magic so that uh, he was unable to defend himself when he when she beat him up. Not a very successful relationship. But the questions that the tribunal wanted to ask Lucia were all planned out in advance and this, th that list of questions survives in the tribunal records. Interestingly, uh, they didn't always follow it. They started off with a list of questions, but then depending on what she said, they veered off in other directions. So you can see the sort of game the tribunal itself is playing here. And on the one hand, you might think, therefore, that the inquisitorial process is being designed, orchestrated by the tribunal, and that the records we've got are produced and shaped by the tribunal's officers. But they're also, in a way, being shaped by the manipulation of the witnesses and the suspects themselves. And occasionally we can do a double check on this. And then I come back to Orazio Cocco in this case. Um, because Orazio was involved in various judicial proceedings in London when he lived there in 1576-1577, when he lived in the Earl of Oxford's house. Uh, when Orazio Cocco was in London, the Earl of Oxford had been accused of a number of sexual crimes. The Inquisition knew that when he was in Venice he had a relationship with a local prostitute, but when he was back in London, um, he'd been accused of multiple sexual offences, I'm sorry to say, with animals and boys, and we know the names of the boys concerned. There was an English boy called Ralph Hopton, a page who'd actually accompanied uh, Oxford to Venice. Uh, there was another Italian boy called Rocco who worked in or, um, uh, Oxford's house in London, and Orazio himself is named 
in these trials as someone who had been abused by the Earl when he was there at the age of 16, 17. And the local story in London was that Orazio had left uh, London and gone back to Venice precisely because he wanted to avoid any further contact with the Earl of Oxford. Now in England these allegations were never fully investigated. The Earl of Oxford was formidably well connected and he managed to uh, dampen down the investigation and get away with it. But the stories, and of course the stories about his relationships may of course have been fabricated, but it's very easy to see why Orazio might have wanted to avoid making uh, ref any references to these stories at all when he was himself questioned by the Inquisition back in Venice. What we find uh, in evidence, therefore, uh, uh, what we see apparent in Orazio's evidence, therefore, to the tribunal is a very carefully crafted autobiographical story about himself, where he holds back certain things he doesn't want the tribunal to know and reveals to them only the things that he thinks they should know uh, to his benefit. All of which, I suppose, leads to uh, my final question. How effective can this Phoenician tribunal really have been, given uh, what I've already said? For all its vaunted powers and authority, its operations were clearly hampered by its very mode of operation. And there were a number of other disadvantages it laboured under as well, um, which I ought to summarise as well, just to give you the few, the real picture. It was completely overwhelmed by business by the sheer volume of business it had to deal with, particularly by the 1580s and the 1590s. It was, as its accounts demonstrate, seriously underfunded, mostly in debt, and that can't have helped. It may have suffered too from a recurrent uh, loss of institutional memory. Between 1560 and 1600, the longest period that any one inquisitor held the position was six years. Many inquisitors held office only for two years or less before moving on to another job. And that, in those sort of circumstances, you're going to lose institutional memory very quickly. In the 1620s, for example, there were five different men who held the post of inquisitor in Venice. Very little institutional memory could have survived. Another point to bear in mind, uh, and it relates back to something I've said already, is that the tribunal was reliant on the state for a lot of what it did. I have mentioned the Fanti, uh, the thugs uh, who it had needed to use for its arrests and so on. It was also reliant on the state for uh, the use of prisons. Uh, the Venetian Inquisition had to use the government's prisons. Um, there were a series of prisons, uh, Santa Maria, um, uh, near San Giovanni Bravara, uh, which were usually debtors' prisons, which the Inquisition were also allowed to borrow from time to time. In the 1580s, the state built these prisons, the new prisons, uh, near the Doge's Palace, and certain of these cells were set aside. Uh, we're looking at them for the Inquisition, not a terribly attractive location. But it, it, it meant, in fact, that the Inquisition had to rely on the state for uh, its facilities. It wanted to imprison people. It's also, I'm sorry to say, dependent on the state for its torture chamber. This is the torture chamber where the inquisitors would carry out their torture. They had to use state torturers, state torture equipment. What you see there is a reconstruction, not the real thing. But this is the room where it happened. And they've tried uh, to lay it out in the way it would have been with the three judges of the tribunal sitting at a desk and the torturer doing whatever the torturer is doing to the suspect in front. Uh, so the state is really still in a way controlling and um, manipulating many of what the inquisitors want to do. And beyond that too, depart, beyond its dependence on the state, it was, as we've seen already, utterly dependent on what uh, could be given to it by local people. Uh, it was dependent on the information that local people, local community would provide it. And we've, it's possible to tell from these trials, uh, in many cases, that uh, many trials were um, initiated in a way by local people for their own ends. Uh, they were not actually reporting what they thought the church ought to deal with. They were trying to diss their neighbours, their, their relations, their business rivals and so on. And very often we can track these disputes, these rows, uh, these controversies and contests through all the other magistracies and judicial uh, organisations in Venice. Uh, 
I spent quite a bit of time looking at the tax offices uh, in Venice, the public health boards, the magistracies dealt, uh, created by the state to deal with offences like blasphemy. And you see time and time again, the same names coming up. One person accusing someone's the Inquisition, that person then accusing the first person uh, for not paying his taxes. The second, the first person then re uh, 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 denouncing someone to the health board for not keeping his drains clear and things like that. You can see how these local disputes are being uh, played out through the city's judicial system. And the inquisitors themselves must have realised this. And you can see them, particularly as the 16th century progresses, increasingly engaged in efforts to restore uh, these local communities to peace and harmony. By 1600, in fact, by which time nobody in Venice seems to have thought Protestantism played any role at all in the city, uh, the activities of the local Inquisition Tribunal in Venice resemble little more, I think, than a mashup of neighbourhood watch, citizens' advice, and relate. So, where do we get to at the end of all this process? Uh, the Inquisition Tribunal in Venice was uh, closed in 1794. By then, the tribunals in many other Italian cities had already been closed and the rest were shut down by the French Revolutionary Armies uh, under Napoleon. The only tribunal, uh, Inquisition tribunal that survives today is the one in Rome, whose palace we've already seen, the Holy Office. Since 15, uh, 1965, it's been known as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, it still has its inquisitorial powers. It rarely subjects Catholics now to trial, though it certainly was still making use of those investigatory powers in the late 20th century. Um, one example uh, was its investigation in 1985, of the Brazilian priest Leonardo Boff, one of the founders of liberation theology, who was ordered by the tribunal to observe a, pe a period of, of um, obedient silence. Uh, for an indefinite period of time after the trial to refrain from all writing and lecturing, uh, teaching and editing. Boff responded rather neatly, I think, by accusing the Cardinal Prefect of the Congregation at the time of religious terrorism, which is a nice charge to put back to the church. But the Congregation of the Holy Office, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, still issues authoritative rulings on matters of Catholic doctrine and practice. One of its most recent uh, was a note on the morality of using anti-COVID-19 vaccines, which have been questioned by a lot of Catholics. You'll be pleased to know the document assures Catholics that the use of such vaccines is licit. So in a way, although we might think of the Inquisition as an institution uh, lost in time, thank goodness, in the past, one element of it is still with us, though now, of course, in a very um, reduced form. Thank you very much. So Nick, thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk and some great slides in there.